Life's got a funny way of kicking you when you're down, or at least that's how it felt for me, Monica. I was just a regular 25-year-old, dealing with the usual mess of a life that seemed to spiral out of control more often than not. My days were filled with the mundane tasks of a job that was as uninspiring as watching paint dry, and my nights? Well, they were spent arguing with Jake, my boyfriend of three years. Jake was, complicated. On good days, he was the guy who'd make you laugh until your stomach hurt. On bad days, he was the master of cold shoulders and harsh words. Our relationship was hanging by a thread, frayed and worn from too many fights about things neither of us would remember the next day. One particularly drab Thursday evening, I found myself sitting across from Jake at our usual spot, a dingy diner that had seen better days. The air was thick with the smell of grease and stale coffee, a fitting backdrop for yet another round of our endless bickering. Why do you always have to be so damn difficult, Monica? Jake snapped, his patience wearing thin. Me? Difficult? You're the one who's impossible to talk to. I retorted, my voice rising in frustration. The conversation went round and round, like a merry-go-round that had lost its charm. It was always the same issues, the same arguments. Money, commitment, the future, you name it, we fought about it. Our words were like daggers, each one sharper and more hurtful than the last. As we left the diner, the cold night air did nothing to cool our tempers. The walk home was silent, each of us stewing in our own anger. The tension was palpable, a thick fog that refused to lift. Once we were back at our cramped apartment, the silence continued. It was as if we had run out of words, the bitterness of our argument leaving us both exhausted and defeated. The only sound was the ticking of the clock, a relentless reminder of the time we were wasting. Lying in bed that night, I couldn't help but wonder where it all went wrong. Was this what the rest of my life would look like? Endless fights with a man who seemed more like a stranger with each passing day. The thought was suffocating, a heavy weight on my chest that made it hard to breathe. It was in that moment of despair that I made a decision. I couldn't live like this anymore. Something had to change. Little did I know, the universe had already set in motion events that would change my life in ways I could never have imagined. But for now, I drifted off to sleep, the storm clouds of my life gathering on the horizon, waiting to burst open. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, tragedy struck. My parents and I were involved in a horrific car accident. It happened so fast, one moment we were talking and laughing, the next everything was chaos and pain. When I woke up in the hospital, the world as I knew it had crumbled. My parents were gone, and I was left alone with a damaged spine and legs that wouldn't move. I couldn't see a future for myself. My life, as I knew it, was over. Lying in the sterile white of my hospital room, I was drowning in thoughts that maybe, just maybe, my life as I knew it was done for. The doctors, with their carefully neutral faces, told me that my road to recovery would be long, maybe never-ending. Rehabilitation will be a significant journey, they said, their voices a mix of professional detachment and pity. But what I heard in their silence was a louder, scarier message, they didn't want to give me false hope. It was during one of those countless, blurred days filled with silent despair that Jake walked into my room, his parents trailing behind him. They had that look people get when they're trying to be strong for someone else, their smiles a bit too tight, eyes a tad too bright. Jake came to the side of my bed, and for a moment, he just looked at me. I saw something in his eyes then, a determination I hadn't noticed before. It scared me a bit, that intensity, because what could he possibly say to make this situation any less of a nightmare? Monica, he began, and his voice cracked like he was fighting back emotions too big for him. I know this is probably the worst timing, and I know you're going through hell right now. But I can't pretend anymore. I can't act like what I feel for you isn't the most real thing I've ever felt in my life. His words hung in the air, heavy and unexpected. Then, before I could even process what he was saying, Jake did something completely crazy. He got down on one knee right there on the cold, hard floor of my hospital room. I love you, Monica. I love you more than I've ever loved anything or anyone in my life. Marry me. 
Let me take care of you. Let me be the one by your side, through all of this and whatever comes next. His parents, standing just a little behind him, had tears in their eyes. His mom, wiping her eyes with the back of her hand, nodded at me, as if encouraging me to say yes. His dad, a man of few words, just placed a supportive hand on Jake's shoulder, a silent show of approval. I was speechless, my mind a whirlwind of emotions. Fear, love, uncertainty, hope, they all battled within me. But looking into Jake's eyes, seeing the raw honesty there, something in me just, unlocked. Yes, I whispered, the word barely audible. Yes, I'll marry you. The relief and joy on Jake's face were like a sunrise after the darkest night. His parents came closer, both of them assuring me, we're going to take care of you, dear, as if you were our own daughter. Your family now. The wedding itself was nothing like I had ever imagined my wedding would be. It was small, intimate, with only the closest of our relatives and friends. I was in my wheelchair, feeling a mix of exhaustion and happiness, a bizarre cocktail of emotions. But when I saw the faces of those who came, saw their genuine smiles and teary eyes, I knew this was right. This was real. Despite the unorthodox circumstances, that day was a blur of love, a testament to something I wasn't sure I believed in anymore, hope. Jake and I, hand in hand, faced our small audience, our vows more than just words, they were promises, a bridge over the uncertainty of my recovery and our future. And as we sealed those vows with a kiss, I allowed myself to believe, maybe for the first time since the accident, that life wasn't over. It was just taking a route I hadn't planned on, a route I wouldn't have to navigate alone. After Jake and I got married, we moved into the big, fancy house my parents left me. It was already fixed up for someone in a wheelchair, with handrails everywhere and special stuff in the bathroom to help me take a shower or a bath. At first, Jake seemed all caring and helpful, like he was really gonna stand by me through thick and thin. But that changed faster than I expected. Not long after we moved in, Jake quit his job. He said it was, cause he needed to take care of me, but honestly, I wasn't seeing much of this so-called care. His excuse was that we didn't need to worry about money, cause of the inheritance I got from my parents. According to him, that meant he didn't need to work anymore. But here's the kicker, I ended up doing most stuff by myself. Cooking, trying to clean up as best as I could, struggling to take a bath, it was all on me. Meanwhile, Jake spent his days glued to his computer screen, playing games, or hanging out with his buddies at some bar. He'd come home late, usually drunk, and then he'd start on me, calling me a burden and whatnot. It wasn't just Jake, either. His parents, who used to be all sweet and caring before we got married, flipped a switch too. They'd come over, and I'd catch them giving me these looks of disgust when they thought I wasn't paying attention. It was like they saw me as some kind of mistake their son had made. One day, I had enough and confronted Jake about it. I was struggling to make a simple meal in the kitchen, and he just waltzed in, looking for something to snack on. Can't believe you're just lounging around all day while I bust my ass trying to do basic stuff. I snapped, my frustration boiling over. Jake just rolled his eyes, grabbing a beer from the fridge. Oh, come on, Monica. You act like you're the only one who's got it tough. I gave up my job for you, remember? Gave up your job? Please, you've made that into some kind of noble sacrifice. All you do is mess around all day while I'm stuck dealing with, with all of this. I gestured around the kitchen, my voice cracking with emotion. And what's that supposed to mean? You think I enjoy having no life outside of this house? You think I like seeing you like this? His voice was getting louder, more aggressive. Having no life? You're out every other night, Jake. How's that having no life? And me? I didn't choose this. I didn't ask for any of it. I was shouting now, tears of anger and frustration welling up in my eyes. The argument spiraled from there, each of us hurling accusations and hurtful words until we were both too exhausted to continue. It was clear as day that the man I married, the family I thought I'd gained, they weren't the support system I'd hoped for. 
They were just another set of obstacles I had to navigate in this new, harsh reality of mine. As the days turned into weeks, the atmosphere in my home shifted from uncomfortable to outright hostile. Jake's parents, who had once put on a facade of concern and affection, now treated my home like their personal kingdom, blatantly disregarding any semblance of respect or boundaries. Their behavior escalated quickly. They roamed the house as if it were theirs, rummaging through the refrigerator at any hour, taking food without so much as a buy your leave. The living room became their domain, the sofas permanently indented from their constant lounging. The television blared from morning till night, filling the house with incessant noise that grated on my nerves. I remember one afternoon, trying to catch a moment of peace, I asked them, yet again, to lower the volume. Could you please turn down the TV? I'm trying to rest, and it's really loud, I pleaded, my voice laced with frustration. My mother-in-law, without so much as glancing my way, waved dismissively and replied, Oh, stop fussing. The volume's fine. You're just too sensitive. Their audacity left me fuming, but nothing prepared me for the discovery I made one quiet morning. I decided to sort through my mother's jewelry, seeking a small connection to her, a moment of solace amidst the chaos. As I opened the cherished casket, my heart sank. The pearl beads, a precious keepsake from my mom, were gone. The shock of their absence was quickly overshadowed by anger when, later that day, I saw the missing beads adorning my mother-in-law's neck. I confronted her, my voice shaking with a mix of rage and disbelief. Those are my mother's pearls. How did they end up with you? She feigned confusion, a poorly masked look of guilt quickly passing over her face, before she retorted, Your mother's? Don't be ridiculous. These have been mine for years. You should be ashamed, accusing me of such nonsense. Her words stung, but they also solidified my growing suspicions about the kind of people I was dealing with. My discomfort turned to vigilance, and it wasn't long before I noticed other items missing, paintings that once graced our walls, expensive dishes that were part of my family's collection. Each disappearance chipped away at my sense of security, leaving me feeling more isolated and betrayed. The final straw came when I caught a glimpse of my mother-in-law one evening, sneaking out with a large, bulging black bag. Her hurried pace and the way she glanced around, thinking she was unnoticed, spoke volumes. I couldn't stay silent any longer. Confronting her the next day, I demanded, what was in that bag you took out last night? More of my things? More of my parents' memories you decided you're entitled to? Her reaction was a mix of defensiveness and guilt. You've got it all wrong, she stammered, avoiding my gaze. I was just, taking some things to donate. Your accusations are hurtful and unwarranted. But her words rang hollow. The evidence was too damning, the pattern too clear. I was living with vultures, picking over the remains of my past life, my family's legacy. The realization was a bitter pill to swallow, leaving me to wonder how I could ever have thought these people were my family. Lily, my beacon in the fog of deceit surrounding me, was more than just a friend at this point, she was my ally in a house that felt more like enemy territory with each passing day. During one of her routine visits for my massage therapy, which had become one of my few solaces, I finally broke down and shared my darkest suspicions about Jake and his parents. The weight of my words hung heavy in the air, thick with betrayal and fear. Lily's response was immediate, a mix of outrage and practicality. Monica, we need solid proof. How about we plant some bugs in the house? Catch them red-handed? Her suggestion, radical as it seemed, was a lifeline. Desperation had a way of making the unthinkable suddenly seem like the only option. So, we did just that. Lily expertly placed tiny recording devices in strategic locations around the house, her movements swift and unseen. The anticipation was torture, waiting for the right moment to listen to the recordings. When we finally sat down to review them, the sense of betrayal I felt was suffocating. Jake and his parents' voices filled the room, their words a testament to their greed and callousness. Jake's voice was the first to cut through the silence. Once Monica is out of the picture, in that institution, everything here is ours. We'll live like kings. 
His mother's laughter was a chilling soundtrack to their scheming. That jewelry sale was just the start. We've barely scratched the surface of what we can make off her inheritance. And his father, always the quiet one, surprised me the most. Keep it down. We don't want her getting wind of this before everything's in place. But yeah, the sooner she's gone, the better. Lily and I exchanged a look of horror. The reality of my situation was worse than I had imagined. They weren't just stealing from me, they were planning to dispose of me, to erase me from my own life. I can't believe this. How could they be so cruel? My voice was barely above a whisper, the hurt and disbelief rendering me almost speechless. Lily, ever my protector, squeezed my hand tighter. We won't let them get away with this, Monica. You're not alone in this fight. But the question of what to do next was daunting. Confrontation seemed too dangerous, given their plans for me. I need to be smart, I said, the gears in my mind turning. They think they're playing me, but now we've got them. I need a plan, something to turn this all back on them. Lily nodded, her determination mirroring my own. We'll figure this out, together. They picked the wrong woman to mess with. As we plotted our next steps, the recordings continued to play, a grim soundtrack to our resolve. Each word from Jake and his parents fueled my determination to fight back, to reclaim my life and my dignity from those who'd so callously tried to strip it away. The dinner table that night felt more like a stage for a performance nobody wanted to attend. Jake and his parents, acting as though nothing was amiss, exchanged glances, loaded with unspoken words. Their feigned ignorance was almost insulting. As we sat there, the chasm between us couldn't have been wider. I couldn't shake the feeling of betrayal, the sting of their deceit cutting deeper with every secretive look they shared. Fueled by a mix of hurt and defiance, I turned to Jake, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside. Jake, look at me. I said, waiting until I had his full attention, his eyes finally meeting mine. Do you love me? Truly? His reaction was a beat too slow, his smile too forced. Of course, I do. You're my wife, he replied, the words sounding rehearsed, empty. That smile, meant to reassure, only served to confirm my suspicions. I smiled back, a hollow mimicry of his, a silent acknowledgement of the lies that hung between us. Waking up to find the ramps gone was like waking up to a nightmare. The realization hit me hard, without them, I was trapped, even more dependent on the very people who sought to control me. I confronted them at breakfast, my frustration boiling over. Why would you remove the ramps? How am I supposed to move around now? I demanded, my voice echoing in the suddenly quiet room. It's for your safety, dear. My mother-in-law cooed, her concern as fake as the pearls she claimed were hers. We're worried you might fall. This is for the best. Their words were a thinly veiled attempt to further isolate me, to clip my wings. I stared at them, their faces a mask of feigned innocence, and said nothing. My silence was strategic, a calm before the storm I was quietly brewing. Behind their backs, I made calls, reached out to the service for the disabled, and enlisted my lawyer's help. They arrived unexpectedly, a welcome intrusion. The shock on Jake and his father's faces was palpable, a mix of fear and disbelief as the team from the service began their assessment, immediately noting the absence of the ramps. My lawyer, ever the professional, wasted no time. We're here to conduct a thorough inventory check, he announced, his tone brooking no argument. An inventory was made after Monica's parents passed. We're going to verify that everything is as it should be. As the meticulous inventory unfolded, the stark reality of betrayal became increasingly apparent. My lawyer, a steadfast presence amidst the chaos, meticulously checked off each item against his exhaustive list, his professionalism a stark contrast to the emotional turmoil swirling around us. The absence of my mother's jewelry, my father's collection of expensive suits, the missing paintings that once adorned the walls with history and culture, antique dishes that were family heirlooms, each missing item was a wound, a testament to the depth of deceit I was surrounded by. The in-laws, once so adept at weaving a facade of concern and familial warmth, 
found themselves cornered by the irrefutable evidence of their greed. Their initial shock quickly gave way to a desperate attempt at salvaging whatever they could from the situation. Tears streamed down my mother-in-law's face as she turned to me, her voice quivering, We're so sorry, dear. It all just got out of hand. Please, can't we move past this? Her husband, my soon-to-be ex-father-in-law, echoed her sentiment, his voice breaking under the weight of his guilt. We never meant to hurt you. It was greed, foolishness. Please forgive us. But the time for forgiveness had long passed. I faced them, the weight of their betrayal heavy on my heart, yet my resolve unwavering. Forgiveness? After everything you've done? You didn't just steal things, you tried to steal my dignity, my independence. I countered, my voice steady and strong. Turning to the police officers, I presented them with the inventory results and the recordings, undeniable proof of the in-laws' deceit. These are the people you're looking for, I said, the finality in my voice marking the end of this chapter of my life. The court proceedings were swift, the evidence overwhelming. The judge's gavel sealed their fate, sentencing them for their crimes, mandating the return of what could be salvaged from their thefts, and compensating for what could not. Watching them face the consequences of their actions, a mix of relief and sorrow washed over me. Justice had been served, but at what cost? Divorcing Jake was a liberating, if painful, process. I also pursued compensation for the mistreatment, a legal acknowledgement of the suffering they had inflicted. Throughout the legal battles, my voice never wavered, my testimony a cathartic release of all the pain and betrayal I had endured. In the end, sitting in a wheelchair on the steps of the courthouse, a sense of closure enveloped me. The journey had been harrowing, a test of my resilience and strength. As I look back on the tumultuous journey I've endured, it's hard not to feel a sense of pride mingled with disbelief. The road to recovery was fraught with uncertainty, yet here I am, making strides, both literally and metaphorically, that once seemed out of reach. My legs, which doctors feared might never regain their strength, are now carrying me forward, step by tentative step. The sensation of pebbles under my feet, a once mundane experience, now fills me with an overwhelming sense of victory. Your progress is nothing short of remarkable. My doctor told me during a recent visit, his voice tinged with genuine astonishment. It was a far cry from the cautious optimism he offered in the early days of my rehabilitation. Reconnecting with my friends has been a lifeline, their unwavering support a constant reminder that I'm not alone in this fight. We're here for you, no matter what. They assure me, their words a bomb to the scars left by betrayal. Jake, the man I once believed would stand by me through thick and thin, has become a distant, almost pitiful figure. Stripped of the financial windfall he so greedily anticipated, he now scrapes by, his calls and apologies a desperate attempt to claw back into my life. Can't we just put all this behind us? Start fresh? He pleads, his voice a mix of desperation and hope. I can't help but laugh, the sound rich with scorn and liberation. Start fresh? With you? I reply, my voice steady and confident. That's a chapter of my life I've happily closed. You're just a footnote now. The flowers he sends, a pathetic attempt at reconciliation, find their way straight into the trash. You think a few roses can erase your betrayal? I scoff, discarding them with ease. They're a reminder of what I've overcome, not of what I've lost. In the midst of navigating this new normal, I've discovered a passion I never knew I had. Painting has become my sanctuary, a way to express the whirlwind of emotions that accompany my journey. An easel and a set of paints are now my most cherished possessions, allowing me to bring memories of my parents to life and to capture the beauty of the world around me. This is how I heal, I explain to anyone who asks, my brush strokes a testament to my resilience. My transformation is not just physical, it's a rebirth of my spirit. They thought they could break me, but I'm stronger than I've ever been, I declare, with newfound determination. My story, once overshadowed by the actions of those who sought to exploit me, is now a narrative of triumph, a reminder that even in our darkest moments, there is light to be found. This chapter of my life, while born from pain and betrayal, is defined by growth, resilience, and the unwavering belief in the possibility of a new beginning.
I am not the same person I was before, I am stronger, wiser, and ready to face whatever comes next with grace and courage. The way Mark and I met could have been ripped straight from a rom-com, a chance encounter at a mutual friend's barbecue, complete with spilled drinks and awkward apologies. He was charming, with a quick wit that had me laughing despite myself. Before I knew it, we were inseparable, our love story unfolding with an ease that felt like destiny. Our wedding was a dream, a simple yet heartfelt ceremony surrounded by those we loved. Mark, with his career in finance on the rise, was the picture of success, and his insistence on a prenuptial agreement was just another part of our planning, a practical step, he said, given our differing financial situations. I didn't mind, my love for him wasn't measured in dollars and cents. Carol, Mark's mother, was a tougher nut to crack. She looked at me like I was an unwelcome guest, her coldness stark against the warmth mark and I shared. But love has a way of making you overlook the small stuff, and I was too happy to let her disapproval dampen my spirits. Even when we faced the heartbreaking news of Mark's infertility, my love didn't falter. If anything, it deepened. I threw myself into making our house a home, filling it with warmth and love, buying appliances and furniture with my own savings to create a cozy nest for us. But as the years passed, the warmth between us cooled, replaced by a chill I couldn't shake. Mark's demands grew, his once-loving requests turning into cold commands. Make sure breakfast is on the table before I leave, Jenna, he'd say, his voice void of the affection that used to lace his every word. And dinner? It had to be fresh, no matter how late I worked, as if my job at the Department of Health and Human Services was just a hobby compared to his high-flying career. I'd wake before dawn, bleary-eyed but determined, to cook his breakfast. Then, after a long day's work, I'd rush home, racing against the clock to whip up a gourmet meal that might bring back the husband I once knew. But it was never enough. He took my efforts for granted, never once uttering a thank you, only reminding me that I should be grateful for the roof over my head, his roof. Our conversations, once filled with laughter and shared dreams, now were battlegrounds, his words cutting deeper each time. This is my house, Jenna. Don't forget that. He'd snap, whenever I dared to suggest anything might be amiss. Each day, as I moved through our home, touching the pieces of our life I'd built with love and care, a thought began to take root in my mind. What if I were alone? The idea, once unthinkable, now felt like a bomb. My love for Mark had been replaced by a weary resignation, worn down by his indifference and coldness. One evening, as I sat at the kitchen table, staring at the empty chair across from me, the realization hit me hard. I no longer recognized the man I had married, nor did I see the woman I had become in his reflection. The love that had once been my guiding light had faded, leaving behind a longing for peace, for a life where my efforts were seen, my presence valued. As I turned off the lights and headed to bed, the silence of the house a stark reminder of the distance between us, I couldn't help but wonder, would I be better off alone? The thought was a whisper in the dark, a question I wasn't quite ready to answer. But with each passing day, the whisper grew louder, a call to find myself again, to reclaim the life and love I deserved. Lately, it's like I'm living with a stranger, not the man I married. Mark's been on my case for everything, the house not being spotless, the dinners being too repetitive. It's like nothing I do is ever enough. I've been finding solace in solo trips to the mall, picking out new furniture and gadgets for our home, trying to fill the void with material things. But even that joy is fleeting when I come home to his coldness. It hit me hard when I realized Mark hadn't put a single penny into our joint account for months. All the expenses, the mortgage, utilities, groceries, have been coming out of my paycheck. So, one evening, I decided it was time to confront him. I waited until he was settled in his armchair, flipping through the channels, and I brought it up, trying to keep my voice steady. Mark, we need to talk about the finances. You haven't contributed to the joint account in months. I've been covering everything, I said, hoping for some understanding, maybe even an apology. He barely glanced at me, his eyes still on the TV. And? It's my house. You're just living in it. 
Why should I pay for your keep? He shot back, his words sharp as knives. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Your keep? Mark, I'm your wife, not some tenant. I've been paying for everything, trying to make this house a home for both of us, I argued, feeling my temper rise. He snorted, a sound that made my skin crawl. Look, Jenna, you're making a big deal out of nothing. If you don't like it, maybe you should just leave. But we both know you've got nowhere to go, he said, turning back to his show. I was seething, hurt and angry, but before I could respond, his phone rang. It was his mother, Carol. He answered on speaker, and before I could escape, she started in on me. Jenna, you need to stop this nonsense and start showing some gratitude. Mark's been too good to you, and here you are, acting like a freeloader. Carol's voice was like a slap in the face. I was so shocked, I barely managed to grab the phone and hang up. I can't believe you and your mother. Calling me a freeloader, in my own home? I said, my voice shaking with emotion. Mark just shrugged, unfazed. Well, if the shoe fits. That night, I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, feeling more alone than ever. The thought of divorce crept into my mind again, more persistent this time. But where would I go? I had no apartment, no real savings of my own. I felt trapped in a life that no longer felt like mine, married to a man who saw me as nothing more than a burden. The next morning, I woke up to an empty bed and a heavy heart. As I made my way through the silent house, every room echoed with the remnants of last night's fight. I knew something had to change, but the fear of the unknown, of starting over from scratch, was paralyzing. Sitting at the kitchen table, sipping my coffee alone, I realized I had to make a decision. Do I stay in this loveless marriage, playing the role of the grateful freeloader, or do I take a leap into the unknown, hoping to land on my feet? The answer wasn't clear, but one thing was, I couldn't go on like this. The breaking point had been reached, and it was time to choose my path. That day at work was a marathon, one meeting after another, no end in sight. I glanced at the clock, knowing Mark would be fuming. Just my luck, I muttered under my breath, finally grabbing my phone to give him a heads up. The moment he picked up, I knew I was in for it. This is your problem, Jenna, not mine. You should have been here, cooking dinner, not playing around at work. Mark's voice roared through the phone, loud enough for the whole office to hear. My cheeks burned as I quickly ended the call, avoiding the curious glances from my colleagues. By the time I got home, it was late, way past our usual dinner time. The house was dark, silent, but the moment I stepped in, Mark was on me like a thunderstorm. Where have you been? A good wife would have had dinner waiting. What are you even good for? His words were like daggers, each one slicing through the last bit of patience I had. I was tired, emotionally drained. Mark, I had to work. You know how important this project is. I tried to explain, but it was like talking to a wall. A bad wife and a terrible hostess. That's what you are. He continued, his voice reaching a pitch I'd never heard before. You know what? I've had enough. Pack your things and get out of my house. I stood there, shocked, as he shoved the divorce papers in my hands. You'll be homeless without me, he said with a cruel laugh. Something inside me snapped. All the years of bending backward for him, trying to be the perfect wife, vanished. Living in a shelter would be better than enduring one more day with you. I shot back, my voice steadier than I felt. Without another word, I signed the papers, my hand not shaking even a bit. I packed my things into a suitcase, the weight of my decision settling in. As I looked around the house, our house, it no longer felt like home. It was just a building, filled with broken promises and shattered dreams. I booked a room at a nearby hotel, a temporary refuge from the storm. Lying in the unfamiliar bed, I realized this was the first night in years I didn't have to worry about what Mark wanted for dinner or if the house was clean to his standards. It was just me, and strangely, it felt like a weight had been lifted. The decision to leave was hard, maybe the hardest I've ever made. But as I drifted off to sleep, a part of me felt excited for what the future might hold. 
For the first time in a long time, I was in charge of my own destiny, no longer tied to someone who saw me as less than. Tomorrow, I would start anew, and whatever challenges lay ahead, I was ready to face them head on. After the whirlwind of leaving Mark and finding myself in a hotel room, the reality of my situation began to sink in. It wasn't long before I got a call that would have once sent me spiraling. It was Carol, Mark's mom, her voice dripping with something like glee. Jenna, dear, she practically sang into the phone. I just heard the wonderful news. My boy has finally come to his senses and divorced you. I'm popping champagne tonight. It's a celebration, dear. He made a huge mistake marrying you, and now it's corrected. Her words, meant to wound, barely scratched the surface. I was past caring what Carol thought. Time will tell, Carol. Time will tell. I replied calmly, a sense of detachment washing over me. I hung up, a small smile playing on my lips. For the first time in years, her barbs couldn't touch me. A week of navigating through my new reality had passed when I decided to open up to my boss about everything. The burden of pretending everything was fine was too heavy to bear alone. I expected sympathy, maybe some understanding, but what I got was a lifeline. Jenna, I'm so sorry you're going through this, but there might be something that can help, she said, her tone shifting from comfort to businesslike. There's a municipal housing program designed for situations like yours. It offers affordable housing solutions to those in need. I think you should apply. I'll help you. Her offer was a beacon of hope in the overwhelming darkness I'd been navigating. With her guidance, I applied for the program, and to my surprise, I was accepted. The relief was immediate, it was like I could finally breathe again. Now, I'm renting a small apartment, modest, but mine. It's quiet, peaceful, a stark contrast to the life I left behind. There's no need to tiptoe around in the mornings, no ungrateful husband to cook for or clean up after. It's just me, and it feels liberating. Sitting in my new living room, surrounded by boxes yet to be unpacked, I couldn't help but reflect on the journey that led me here. It's been tough, filled with moments of doubt and fear, but also moments of unexpected kindness and newfound strength. For the first time in a long time, I'm excited about the future. I've got a blank canvas in front of me, and I'm ready to start painting a new life, one where my happiness doesn't depend on anyone else. It's a new beginning, and I'm here for it, ready to see where this next chapter takes me. It had been a quiet few months since I started over, finding peace in the simple routines of my new life. Then, one afternoon, as I was enjoying a rare moment of calm, my phone erupted into a cacophony of rings. The screen flashed a name I hadn't seen in ages, Carol, my ex-mother-in-law. My heart sank. Why now? Bracing myself, I answered. Hello? Jenna. You need to come back to mark this instant. Carol's voice screeched through the speaker, so loud I had to pull the phone away from my ear. I sighed. Carol, why would I ever do that? The question was rhetorical, more for myself than for her. Because he's in trouble, that's why. That fool of a son of mine, bought shares years back, took out loans, and now? He's up to his neck in debt. It's a disaster, and you need to help him sort it out. Her voice was a mix of anger and desperation. I couldn't help but laugh, not out of amusement, but sheer disbelief. Help him? Carol, do you remember the prenup? The one Mark was so eager to have? It says clearly that I'm not responsible for his debts. And let's not forget, we're divorced. His financial mess isn't my problem. There was a sharp intake of breath on the other end. Ungrateful girl. After everything we've done for you, you're just going to abandon him? Her tone was accusatory, as if I had committed a grave sin. Everything you've done? Carol, let's be clear. The only thing you and Mark ever did was make my life miserable. And as for abandoning him, remember, he kicked me out. He made it clear I was no longer welcome in his life or his house. I retorted, my patience wearing thin. You'll regret this, Jenna. You think you're better off without him, but you're making a huge mistake. She spat out, her voice venomous. I took a deep breath, 
finding a calm I didn't know I had. Carol, I've spent too much of my life living in regret and fear because of you and Mark. I'm done. Mark's debts are his own doing. It's time he learns to deal with his own mess. I'm moving on with my life. Goodbye, Carol. With that, I ended the call, a sense of finality washing over me. I had expected to feel shaken, upset, maybe even guilty. But all I felt was relief. Standing up to Carol, making it clear that I was no longer part of their twisted family drama, felt like shedding a weight I'd been carrying for too long. Sitting back down, I let out a long breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding. The conversation with Carol, as unpleasant as it was, served as a stark reminder of how far I'd come. I had fought hard for my independence, my peace, and no amount of guilt tripping could drag me back into that chaos. For the first time in what felt like forever, I felt truly free. Free from the expectations, the criticisms, the endless cycle of trying to please people who would never see my worth. I had found my strength, my voice, and I wasn't going to let anyone take that away from me again. As I looked around my small apartment, a sense of pride filled me. This was my space, my sanctuary, and my new beginning. I had survived the storm and come out stronger on the other side. And no call, no matter how unexpected or unwelcome, could change that. The next morning, I woke up with a resolve as clear as day, it was time to reclaim what was mine. I rummaged through my files until I found the receipts for all the items I had poured my money into over the years. The sleek dishwasher that made Mark's life easier, the washing machine we picked out together, though, let's be honest, I paid for, and the high-end coffee machine that became the centerpiece of many of his mornings. It wasn't just about the money, it was about the principle, about not letting my contributions be erased and taken for granted any longer. With a moving truck booked and a couple of strong helpers at my side, I went back to the house that was no longer a home. The door opened to an eerie silence, a stark contrast to the chaos of emotion swirling inside me. As the workers started loading up the truck, I couldn't help but feel a mix of satisfaction and sadness. Each piece of furniture, each appliance, had a story, a memory attached to it. But as they say, you can't cling to the past if you want to move forward. Just as we were finishing up, my phone rang. I knew without looking who it was. Mark's name flashed on the screen, his call as predictable as it was unwanted. I answered, bracing myself for the storm. Where the hell is all my stuff? He bellowed, skipping any pretense of a greeting. Your stuff? I couldn't help the incredulous laugh that escaped me. You mean the things I bought with my money? I've taken them back, Mark. According to our prenup, I have every right to. His curses and insults flew fast and furious, a torrent of anger that once would have cowed me. But not anymore. Listen, Mark. I cut in, my voice steady. I wish you the best, truly. But this is where our paths diverge for good. And with that, I hung up and blocked his number, a symbolic gesture of cutting the final tie that bound me to a life that no longer served me. As the moving truck drove away, my heart felt lighter than it had in years. This wasn't just about reclaiming my possessions, it was about reclaiming my life, my independence, and my self-worth. I knew there would be challenges ahead, but for the first time in a long time, I felt ready to face them head-on, on my own terms. Six months down the line, life's taken a turn I hardly dared dream of. I've snagged myself a cozy apartment in a neat part of town, all thanks to this social program my boss tipped me off about. The deal was sweet, a manageable down payment, with tiny payments stretching out over the years. For the first time, I'm not just scraping by, I've got a bit of wiggle room in my budget, enough to spoil myself without worrying about anyone else's needs or wants. The day I got the keys to my place, I remember stepping through the door, the sense of ownership washing over me. It was a blank canvas, and for the first time in forever, I could paint my life exactly how I wanted. No compromises, no sacrifices, just me. I treated myself to some paints and canvases, a nod to the girl I used to be, the one who found joy in splashing watercolors around, lost in the flow of her own creativity. I even painted a self-portrait, something I'd never have dared do before. 
Staring at my work, I saw a woman who'd weathered storms and come out stronger, a woman who didn't need anyone else to define her worth. It was like I was seeing myself clearly for the first time, beautiful, self-sufficient, and yeah, a bit selfish, but in the best possible way. And then there's Max, my little bundle of joy, a scrappy little dog with eyes too big for his face and a heart just as oversized. Adopting him felt like the final piece of my new life clicking into place. We've become a team, exploring the neighborhood, making the apartment our home. One evening, as Max and I were curled up on the couch, my phone buzzed. It was a text from a friend I hadn't seen since the divorce storm hit. Heard you're doing well. Coffee sometime? I smiled, typing out a reply. Yeah, life's good. Coffee sounds great. My place, actually. I've got some art to show off. Look at you, all artsy and independent. Can't wait to see it. And meet Max, of course, came the reply. Laughing, I set the phone down, looking around my little apartment, my sanctuary. It's funny how life works out. Once, I thought I needed a husband, a big house, and a certain lifestyle to be happy. Now, I've got a small apartment, a dog, and my art, and I've never felt more fulfilled. Max, buddy. I said, scratching behind his ears. We're doing just fine on our own, aren't we? He barked in agreement, and I laughed, feeling a surge of gratitude for my independence, for the struggles that brought me here, and for the simple joys that filled my days now. This was happiness, unfiltered and undiluted, and it was all mine. Life's taken a turn I could have never predicted a year ago. Just the other day, while having my morning coffee and scrolling through the news on my phone, I stumbled upon a headline that stopped me cold, my ex, Mark, had been declared bankrupt. His house, the one he was so proud of, the one he kicked me out of, had been sold off to cover his debts. Now, he's back living with his mom, Carol. I couldn't help the small, satisfied smile that crept up on my face. Breaking free from him was the best decision I ever made. These days, my mornings are spent wandering the park with Max, my loyal little sidekick. The fresh air, the peaceful quiet, it's a far cry from the tense, stifling atmosphere of my old life. And it's not just the walks, I found a new passion that's breathed life into my world, painting. I joined the local amateur artists club on a whim, thinking it'd be a casual hobby. But it quickly grew into something more. I started exhibiting my paintings at local shows, the vibrant colors and bold strokes a reflection of my newfound freedom and joy. At one of these exhibitions, my path crossed with someone unexpected. I was standing beside one of my pieces, a watercolor that I felt particularly proud of, when a man approached. He studied the painting with an intensity that made me curious. That's quite beautiful, he said, nodding towards the canvas. Did you paint this? I couldn't hide my grin. Yeah, I did. Thank you. We got to talking, and it turned out we had a lot in common. Before I knew it, we were sitting in a nearby cafe, chatting over coffee like old friends. He was easy to talk to, with a warmth and a sense of humor that I'd missed in my interactions for so long. He even bought my painting. I want to see this first thing every morning, he said. It's inspiring. That coffee turned into dinner a few days later, and then into walks in the park, Max trotting alongside us. He introduced me to his kids, two bright sparks, who welcomed me with open arms and laughter. It felt natural, easy, like a piece of my life that had been missing without me even realizing it. One evening, after the kids had gone to bed and we were sitting on his porch, he turned to me. You know, I'm really glad I bought that painting, he said, his voice soft in the twilight. I smiled, leaning my head on his shoulder. Me too. It's funny how things work out. It got me thinking about how far I'd come, from feeling trapped and hopeless to standing on the cusp of something beautiful, something new. I was free from the shadows of my past marriage, ready to dive into the future, whatever it might hold. As Max and I continued our morning walks, I found myself reflecting on the journey. The pain, the struggle, it all led me here, to a place of peace and potential. I was ready to embrace whatever came next, open-hearted and free. 
life, it seems, has a way of surprising you, of turning the page when you least expect it. And as I walked, the sun breaking through the trees, I couldn't help but feel grateful for every twist, every turn that brought me here. Ready for a new chapter, I stepped forward, into the light.